This video is brought to you by Nebula and CuriosityStream. Everybody remembers their first encounter with Shakespeare. You have not experienced Shakespeare until you have read him in the original Klingon. Be or not a bee, that is the question. Helen. Hell yeah. Whether it was positive or negative, it's always memorable. Caesar salad. Ah! At du Brute? Nope. Mine was in the fourth grade at my local performing arts center. Our school took us to see a somewhat strange production of The Tempest. It was abridged, so performers would come out, do a scene or two, and then a person would stand at a spotlighted podium and summarize what had happened in between. At around 10 years old, I was completely at sea and had no idea what was happening. The scenes were strange. A moodily lit shipwreck scared me. A goddess who billowed like the wind enchanted me. The two fools and Caliban made me laugh even if I barely understood what they were saying. Like I said, one's first experience with the bard is always memorable. Romeo, oh Romeo, wherefore art thou, Romeo? I didn't start to get into Shakespeare until college, and I didn't discover my favorite Shakespeare play until I was in my early 20s. A tale of misadventure, misunderstandings, and much ado about nothing. By far, one of the most romantic and funniest lines in theater history was born here. I do love nothing in the world so well as you. Is not that strange? This line is said by one of theater history's most iconic duos, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Much Ado About Nothing, like most Shakespeare plays, has a somewhat complicated publication history. I'll get to that later, but the play first premiered in the late 1590s, and it takes place in Italy, in the city of Messina in Sicily. It is set after a recent military conflict between Don Pedro, the Prince of Aragon, and his brother Don John the Bastard, which Don Pedro won. Afterwards, Don Pedro and Don John reconciled, and they came with their followers to Messina. The story follows two pairs of lovers. One pair wishes to be in love but misunderstands each other, and one pair misunderstands each other and then they fall in love. There's also a plain-dealing villain, a couple of errant knaves, and the prettiest piece of flesh is any in Messina. So with that, let's run down the characters. First, there are the two sharp-tongued lovers, Beatrice and Benedict. Both have wit to spare and are quick to speak their thoughts on any matter and every matter. Let him be a handsome fella, or else make another curtsy and say, Father, as it please me. Oh, Did you buy her that you inquired after her? Can the world buy such a jewel? Yeah. And a case to put it into. It is heavily implied that the pair might have had a relationship prior to the play that ended badly. You always end with a jade's trick. I know you of all. You have lost the heart of Signor Benedict. Indeed, good sir. He lent it me a while. And I gave him use for it. A double heart for his single one. But I personally think neither of them ever really got over each other, which is why it's so easy for them to fall in love again through their friends' machinations. On the other end of the spectrum, we have Hero and Claudio. The pair speak softly to their friends and very little to each other. Silence is the perfectest herald of joy. <laughs> their potential marriage is the driving force of the play, and yet they only exchange words in three scenes in the entire play. Act 2, scene 1, where they get engaged. Act 4, scene 1, at the wedding. And Act 5, scene 4, where their plot is resolved. Professor Laurie McGuire of Magdalen College, Oxford, observed the strange paradox of Much Ado, which is that everything happens to Hero and Claudio, but they have nothing to say about it. Speak, cousin. Or, if you cannot, stop his mouth with a kiss and let him not speak neither! <laughs> and nothing happens to Benedict and Beatrice, and they have everything to say about it. So they are spoken and these things are true. This looks not like a nuptial. <laughs> 
Then we have Signor Leonardo, Hero's father and Beatrice's uncle. He's the patriarch of the piece and the governor of Messina. He has a brother, Antonio, who he talks to about various matters, and a wife, Inigen. Although Inigen has no lines, so many productions don't include her or combine her with Antonio, giving Leonardo's wife the lines his brother spoke. Then we've got Don Pedro, the Prince of Aragon, leader amongst his fellows and followers, Claudio and Benedict. Don Pedro ministers to Claudio about his romance with Hero and sets about setting up Benedict and Beatrice. If we can do this, Cupid, no longer an archer. His glory shall be ours, <laughs> for we are the only love gods. Then we've got the villains. First, there's Don John the Bastard. And this, though I cannot be said to be a flattering, honest man, it must not be denied, but I am a plain dealing villain. The play doesn't bother to give Don John a reason or justification for his malcontent and machinations. I cannot hide what I am. I must be sad when I have cause. Although, given that he is not a true heir to Aragon like his brother Don Pedro, being, as the play names him, a bastard. And if their wisdoms be misled in this, the practice of it lives in John the Bastard, whose spirits toil and frame a villainy. And he did recently lose to his brother in some sort of military action. Let me bid you welcome, my lord. Being reconciled to the prince, your brother. That is probably a lot of the justification for his anger, but he just wants to cause trouble. If I can cross him any way, I bless myself every way. He has two followers, Conrad and Baraccio, who assist him in his misdeeds for a fee. Lastly, we have the Watchman, Dogberry and his right-hand man, Virgis. They lead the Watch and have a hand in uncovering the truth of Don John's villainy. Also, they are the source of many comic mishaps in the play. My personal favorite is that Dogberry can't count. Marry, Mary, sir, they have committed false reports. Mm. Moreover, they have spoken untruths. Uh. Secondarily, uh, they are the slanderers. Uh, uh, slanderers? Uh, uh, hey, hey. Sixth and lastly, they've lied to the lady. Thirdly, they have verified unjust things. Then to conclude, they are lying knaves. So now let's talk about how there's a 50% chance that you were taught Shakespeare wrong in school. At my school, we spent about a week on Romeo and Juliet while my teacher droned on about what sections to highlight. It was a very dull experience, followed by two days spent watching that 60s or 70s adaptation. The following year when we did Othello, it was more of the same. And in that class, we only watched some clips from the movie adaptation with Kenneth Branagh and Lawrence Fishburne. Also, you can bet our teacher did not touch on the racial dynamics of the play in any way. From what I can tell, this is a fairly common experience of Shakespeare. Although some may try to get students to perform the text, it seems to be very common to read and analyze first, and then if you're lucky, watch a movie second. But it's the worst way to teach these plays, because they're plays that were intended to be watched, not read. And a lot of people seem to come out of an uninspired course on Shakespeare going, God, I hate Shakespeare. Oh, that's right, I said it. No, I do, I hate Shakespeare. Even some Shakespeare scholars say that treating Shakespeare plays as text first rather than as performance is wrong. If schools insist on spending a week highlighting passages in a Shakespeare text, they should at least start with a viewing of the Shakespeare play in question. Either a movie adaptation or a filmed play, both are very easily accessible these days. Because in my experience, I tended to get a little lost with the definitions of Elizabethan English, but watching an actor perform the text makes it make sense. I left no ring with her. What means this lady? Fortune forbid my outside have not charmed her! <laughs> Through the performer's choices and intonations, I understood the text, and more than that, I was able to appreciate it. How shall I be revenged on him? I think the best way is to entertain him with hope, eh? To the wicked fires of lust, melts him into his own grease. While it does take a little bit of work to understand all the nuances of Shakespeare play that can often be lost in archaic language and jokes that just aren't made anymore, so much of it is made clear through performance, and especially modern performance. Thou hast undone our mother! Willem, I have done thy mother! Oh, God. <laughs> now, this might be personal taste, but I really struggle with the adaptations that are overly staid and classical. Now, many of you have seen Shakespeare done very much like this. 
O Titus, bring your friend hither. Shakespeare was bawdy. His plays were enjoyed by common folk as well as royalty. If you don't understand a line in Shakespeare, there's a 50% chance that it's a dick joke. My favorite thing in most modern Shakespeare productions is the energy and humor they infuse into it. Love me. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Where the style from even 30 to 40 years ago seemed almost determined to be dull and humorless. Love me? Why, it must be requited. The comedies should be funny, and the tragedies are often verging on psychological thriller or action film. Also, I don't know why so many high schools insist on only teaching the tragedies. I really think that the comedies would be much more engaging to teach a high school class. I see, lady, the gentleman is not in your book. No, and he were, I would burn my study. <laughs> I prefer his comedies personally, although Macbeth does slap. Generally speaking, Shakespeare plays actually come in three categories. There are the comedies, the tragedies, and the histories. The Henry plays and the Richard plays, etc. Those are the histories, which he was probably commissioned to do by Queen Elizabeth, who was one of his patrons. But yeah, I didn't pick up a love for Shakespeare from school. I learned that later. And there's so much fun that can come from digging into his works. For instance, Shakespeare loved an ineffectual constable with a silly name. There's Dogberry in Much Ado, Constable Dull in Love's Labor's Lost, and my personal favorite, Constable Elbow in Measure for Measure. Elbow! I do lean upon justice, mom. <laughs> he also really loved cross-dressing as a subplot. It's not just in Twelfth Night, it's in As You Like It, Merchant of Venice, Two Gentlemen of Verona, Cymbeline, and briefly in The Merry Wives of Windsor. He also loved a friar with a wacky plan that involves somebody faking their death. This plotline features in Romeo and Juliet, Measure for Measure, and of course, Much Ado. And, to quote Tumblr user Rome Ho Montague, I don't really want to write this essay. The little Shakespearean friar living in my brain, FAKE YOUR DEATH! What? Plays that were written in the 15 and 1600s are not without their problems, and I'll get to that, but I just feel like somebody missed a trick when they decided that my school and many others were just going to spend two weeks dully going over Elizabethan definitions instead of exploring the joy and silliness that could be found in a Shakespeare play. And with that, let's dig into Act 1 of Much Ado. Act 1 begins by very quickly setting up that Hero and Claudia were into each other and Benedict and Beatrice hate each other. We learn that Don Pedro was coming to Messina after winning his wars and Claudia was coming with him, having done well in battle. I pray you, is Signor Montanto returned from the war? <laughs> oh no. And Benedict is coming too. The men all show up and shout out to Kenneth Branagh for having them show up like this. It's very extra, I like it. And we're introduced to Benedict and Beatrice's merry war soon after the soldier's arrival. I wonder that you will still be talking, Signor Benedict. Nobody marks you. My dear Lady Disdain. Are you yet living? <laughs> And from there, Claudio talks to Benedict about Hero and professes that he's in love with her. Benedict is very upset by this. It's come to this. Shall I never see a bachelor of three score again? Go to it, Faith. Don Pedro joins them, and after a little noodling around, Benedict tells him about Claudio's crush. He is in love! <laughs> <laughs> with who? Now, that is a gracious part. Mark how short his answer is. With Hero! Leonardo's short daughter. Then Benedict goes on to say some more stuff about how he'll never be married and some more empty posturing before he leaves. In his absence, Don Pedro advises Claudio on how to get an engagement with Hero. He devises an unnecessarily complicated plan where at the masked ball he'll pretend to be Claudio and romance Hero and arrange things with Leonardo on Claudio's behalf. Once they leave, we properly meet Don Pedro's brother, Don John, and I have to quickly shout out probably my favorite Don John from this 1970s CBS production. Actor Jerry Mayer gives a truly unhinged performance. That Captain Claudio will marry the daughter of Leonardo! He will marry her! It is! It is! So he will marry And there's... Iconic. My second favorite Don John is obviously Keanu Reeves, who has the best frown and spends a scene shirtless wearing leather pants. 
But in essence, Don John is unhappy for no particular reason that he can specify, but he wants to cause mischief for everybody, including his brother, Leonardo, and Claudio. So he and his followers, Conrad and Baraccio, decide to mess with Claudio and Hero's potential engagement. Come, come! Let us thither. This may prove food to my displeasure. While it's possible to enjoy Shakespeare without getting every oblique reference, Is it not strange that sheep's guts should hail souls out of men's bodies? It is possible to enrich one's enjoyment by digging into the minutia and wordplay at work. For instance, the title of Much Ado About Nothing carries several meanings. The old pronunciation of nothing was actually noting, and this play involves a lot of observing, perceiving, and overhearing. And 90% of the play's conflict comes from correct or incorrect perceptions that the characters have about each other. But also, nothing was a ye olde euphemism for female genitalia, so an alternative title for the play is Much Ado About Pussy. But that's not all. You may have heard of a little ditty called iambic pentameter in Shakespeare plays, but that only applies to verse in his plays. He also wrote a lot in prose. Now, if you want to know what's in prose and what's in iambic pentameter, generally, iambic pentameter is written out in lines of 10 syllables. Also, if you're reading a Shakespeare play, it's subtle, but most editions are formatted so that the prose lines start right next to the name of the person speaking, while verse will start on the line beneath the name of the speaker. Now, there is this idea that only smart people speak in verse in Shakespeare plays, but that's not really true. Benedict and Beatrice are very intelligent, and they speak mostly in prose. In one scene, Benedict attempts to write a bit of poetry for Beatrice, and it's terrible. O oh God of love. <laughs> That's it above. Who knows me? <laughs> Meanwhile, Hero and Claudio speak a lot of verse, and Claudio in particular is. I would say, not very bright. My personal take is that verse comes in when scenes become too dramatic. Prose is not enough, and so characters must speak in poetry. That may not be true in all Shakespeare plays, but I think it's true in this one. Actors Michelle Terry and Paul Reddy, who have both been in productions of Much Ado, said on the Globe Theatre podcast, Such Stuff, that prose is often used as a shield to cover one's true feelings in Much Ado, and verse is what comes from the heart. Then there are the soliloquies, the moments when an actor directly addresses an audience and, in a sense, creates a relationship between them. When I said I would die a bachelor, I did not think I would live till I were married. <laughs> In Much Ado, Benedict gets the most soliloquies of any character, I think. Michelle Terry and Paul Reddy suggested that Benedict is constantly seeking affirmation from the audience in his soliloquies. Here comes Beatrice. By this day, she's a fair lady. I do spy some marks of love in her. <laughs> Which points to a deep insecurity in his character. Meanwhile, Beatrice only speaks to them once, after her gulling scene. Stand up! Condemned for pride and scorn so much! One could read it as Beatrice is more secure in herself and doesn't need that affirmation, but it does lead to an imbalance of sorts. Of course, Claudio also addresses the audience in a moment of self-pity where we know he's wrong, so that direct address can do a lot of different things and actors can add moments of audience interaction if they so choose. He that hath a beard is more than a youth, and he that hath no beard is Less than a man. I'm sorry. <laughs> now, aside from those overarching style choices, there are a few bits of more archaic wordplay that could stand to be defined for Much Ado. You may have noticed I've referred to the gulling scenes in this play. To gull meant to deceive, dupe, or trick. I should think it's a gull, but the white-bearded fellow speaks it. When the House of Messina schemes to have Benedict and Beatrice fall into a mountain of affection, the one with the other. This involves a bit of trickery. 
There's also a lot of jokes referencing cuckoldry in this play. So for the uninitiated, this term comes from the cuckoo bird, who sometimes lays their eggs in other birds' nests, and then those other birds raise those chicks as their own. To cuckold, in Shakespeare terms, is to steal another man's wife and in some cases get her pregnant, so the husband will raise another man's child. In Shakespeare times, there were some weird associations with cuckoldry, like this idea that the cuckolded man would sprout horns. Potentially, horns they could not perceive, but others could, making their embarrassment a public spectacle. Also, sometimes the idea was that they would have to blow on a horn to announce their shame or something. Basically, Much Ado makes a lot of jokes about cuckoldry. I think this is your daughter! Her mother hath many times told me so! And a lot of jokes specifically referencing horns. The savage bull may, but if ever the sensible Benedict bear it, pluck off the bull's horns and set them in my forehead. Usually it's Benedict when he's misogynistically decrying all women and saying he will never marry. In these scenes, he essentially claims no woman would be good enough and they would cheat on him once they're married, which, okay, Benedict, go eat a Snickers or something, good lord. A lot of this play centers men's insecurities about women, but this one might be lost on a modern audience. But the fun also comes from new jokes that can be added to a performance from the modern interpretation of this old text. I wonder that you will still be talking, Senor Benedict. Nobody marks you! <laughs> and I would, I could find in my hort that I had not a hort hort, for truly I love none. Like, it's silly, but I'm all about that silliness. Embrace the absurd, embrace the ridiculousness. There's plenty more where that came from. That your niece Beatrice was in love with Signor Benedict. What? What? <laughs> Two takes us to Leonardo's masked ball, after a bit from Beatrice where she schools her obedient cousin. Yes, faith, it is my cousin's duty to make curtsy and say, Father, as it please you. But yet, for all that cousin, you let him be a handsome fellow. Or else make another curtsy and say, Father, as it please me. <laughs> and then we get the ball where many shenanigans ensue. We see heroes made Margaret flirting with a masked Benedict, although most productions change this to Baraccio, which makes more sense for later bits, or to Balthazar, who in the text enters for the latter half of the scene. Well, would you like me? So would not I, for your own sake, for I have many ill qualities. Which is one? I say my prayers aloud. I love you the better. The heroes may cry, Amen. God match me with a good dancer. Amen. Meanwhile, Don Pedro is doing like he said and wooing Hero for Claudio. And a masked Benedict thought he might mess with Beatrice, telling her some insults under the guise that they came from someone else. Of course, Beatrice doesn't really care about the insults and correctly guesses that they come from Benedict. I pray you, what is he? Why, he's the prince's jester! A very dull fool. His only gift is in devising impossible slanders. None but libertines delight in him, and the commendation is not in his wit, but in his villainy. For he both pleases men and angers them, and then they laugh at him <laughs> and beat him. When I know the gentleman, I'll tell him what you say. <laughs> you. You. Later, Benedict complains at length about this interaction. She told me, not thinking I'd been myself, <laughs> that I was the prince's jester. That I was duller than a great fool, huddling jest upon jest with such <laughs> impossible conveyance upon me that I stood like a man at a mark. And in the middle of all of this, Don John approaches Claudio, who is masked, and pretends he's speaking to Benedict. And that is Claudio. I know him by his bearing. And aren't you, Signor Benedict? Oh, you know me well. I am he. <laughs> And it should be noted, Don John is not hiding his identity in this scene. Senor, you are very near my brother and his love. And he tells Claudio that Don Pedro woos Hero for himself. Claudio believes him and gets very bent out of shape. Friendship is constant in all of the things. Save in the office and affairs of love. For beauty is a witch against whose charms faith melteth into blood. 
So when Beatrice brings him to Don Pedro, he's in a full-on pout. Wherefore are you sad? Not sad, my lord. Beatrice is the one who quickly susses out the misunderstanding. The Count is neither sad nor sick nor merry nor well, but civil, Count. Civil as an orange <laughs> and something of that jealous complexion. And so Don Pedro explains everything is set, Hero has agreed to marry Claudio, and he has obtained Leonardo's permission for the marriage. And a dumbstruck Claudio just kind of stands there for a minute. Speak, Count. Tis your cue. But then again, Hero is equally struck silent in the face of potential joy. Speak, cousin. Or, if you cannot, stop his mouth with a kiss and let not him speak neither. Don Pedro observes that Beatrice has a merry heart. Hey, my lord, I thank it, poor fool. It keeps on the windy side of care. Beatrice notes that everyone's getting married except her, and Don Pedro offers to marry her. Will you have me? Lady. <laughs> no, my lady. Unless I might have another for working days. Ooh, um. Your grace is too costly to wear every day. <laughs> After this, Beatrice is sent off by Leonardo, and Don Pedro observes that she will not tolerate the idea of a husband much in the same way Benedict will not tolerate the idea of a wife. This is when he has the big idea to make Benedict and Beatrice fall in love. For we are the only love gods! <laughs> Hero, Leonardo, and Claudio all agree to take part in the plot. From there, we see Don John talking with Baraccio about the upcoming marriage. Any bar, any cross, any impediment will be medicinal to me. I am sick! in displeasure to him. And whatsoever comes of what is affection rages evilly with mine. Well, how canst thou cross this marriage? Baraccio lays out the new plan, saying he's been seeing Hero's gentlewoman, Margaret, and if Don John can get Claudio and Don Pedro to come to Hero's window that evening, Baraccio will be at her window with Margaret, calling Margaret by the name of Hero. Don John likes the plan and pays Baraccio a thousand ducats. Then we get one of the most ridiculous and hilarious scenes in the play, Benedict's gulling. Don Pedro, Leonardo, and Claudio set up to have a loud conversation where Benedict can overhear and shenanigans ensue. Come hither, Leonardo. What was it you told me of today that your niece Beatrice was in love with Signor Benedict? <laughs> This is the scene where many productions have the most fun, and I love it. She's exceeding wise. In everything but in loving Benedict. What? You? <laughs> I love every version. The sillier, the better. I would have thought her spirit had been invincible against all assaults of affection. Especially against Benedict. <laughs> she doth indeed show some sparks that are like wit. <laughs> I think my favorite might be the wet paint version in David Tennant and Catherine Tate's Much Ado About Nothing. Down upon her knees she falls, weeps, sobs, oh sweet Benedict, God give me patience! <laughs> I particularly love the versions where Don Pedro, Leonardo, and Claudio really commit to the bit. In everything but in loving Benedict. <laughs> I could wish he would modestly examine himself to see how much he is unworthy, so good a lady. <laughs> it's great, and by the end of the scene, Benedict has been thoroughly convinced, and the boys decide that it'll be really funny to have Beatrice call him into dinner. And Benedict stands there amazed. This can be no trick. <laughs> the conference was sadly born. Love me. Why? I did never think to marry. I must not seem proud. As Beatrice approaches, Benedict tells us. Here comes Beatrice. By this day, she is a fair lady. I do spy some marks of love in her. <laughs> she tells him to come in, as tartly as possible. Against my will, I am sent to bid you come into dinner. And a goofy Benedict thanks her for her pains. If it had been painful, I would not have come. You take pleasure then in the message? Eventually, she gets fed up and leaves, and Benedict tells us, Against my will, I am sent to bid you 
come in to dinner. There's a double meaning in that. And he concludes, If I do not take pity of her, I am a villain. If I do not love her, I'm a Jew. Wait, what? No, this was supposed to be the fun video. No, wait, no, no! I swear to God, I was going to take a break from the anti-Semitism rants. I really was. This was going to be a fun time for me after three months mired in very upsetting research. But as it happens, I prefer to watch Shakespeare more than read him, and it turns out Shakespeare's works are littered with casual anti-Semitism that most modern productions cut because they don't scan well. Especially in the comedies like Much Ado, where modern productions change the line to fool, to beast, to dog. I am a dog. A dog. I think that one's funny because the actor seems to almost tacitly be acknowledging they changed the line. Even Kenneth Branagh's fairly book-accurate 1993 film cuts the line entirely. There's a double meaning in that. According to the Arden Shakespeare, the definition for Jew as an epithet means ungenerous person from the Elizabethan caricature of Jews as rapacious usurers, void of Christian charity and a person of no faith from a Christian perspective. The epithet, or a variant of it, appears in A Midsummer Night's Dream, Henry IV Part I, Love's Labor's Lost, Macbeth, Richard II, and twice in Two Gentlemen of Verona. I had naively assumed all the anti-Semitism was contained in Merchant of Venice, but it isn't. Now, there is a lot of debate about anti-Semitism in Merchant of Venice, a play that has been adapted and performed in Hebrew and Yiddish, so obviously there's something that resonates with the Jewish audience. And it all comes down to Shylock. So, real quick, the plot of Merchant of Venice is that this guy, Antonio, is a merchant in Venice, and he's sad. His friend Bassanio, a well-born gentleman who is financially strapped at the moment, is in love with a girl named Portia. He asks Antonio if he can borrow 3,000 ducats as part of his plan to romance Portia, and Antonio doesn't have the money, but he loves Bassanio, so he borrows the money from Shylock, a Jewish moneylender and usurer. By the way, usury is just lending money with interest, an extremely common thing now that was considered very bad and unchristian, even though the Venetian economy couldn't function without usury and money lending at the time. But in Merchant of Venice, Shylock hates Antonio because he's pretty anti-Semitic. But lend it rather to thine enemy. Uh. <clears throat> Who, if he break, Thou mayest with better face exact the penalties! You call me misbeliever, cutthroat dog, and spat upon my Jewish Aberdeen, and all for use of that which is mine own. And, side note, most modern productions play Antonio as gay because of lines like this. Say how I loved you. Speak me fair in death. And when the tale is told, bid her be judge whether Bassanio had not once a love. So that's interesting, I guess. Even if he is meant to be gay, he's still a Christian, and as such, he still has more power than Shylock, who is not considered a real citizen of Venice. So anyway, Shylock hates Antonio, and so he agrees to lend the 3,000 ducats, and if Antonio doesn't pay him back in the agreed-upon time, Shylock will cut out a pound of his flesh. To be cut off and taken in what part of your body pleases me. <laughs> so when inevitably shit goes sideways and Antonio can't pay him back, they go to trial. Also, in the interim, Shylock's daughter Jessica elopes with a Christian named Lorenzo, taking with her a case full of some of Shylock's wealth, and also a ring that belonged to his dead wife, Jessica's mother. Afterwards, people mock Shylock for his grief and anger, which further incites his rage towards Antonio. At the trial, Shylock demands his pound of flesh, and Portia, disguised as a man, advocates for Antonio. They offer Shylock twice what he was owed in 6,000 ducats, but Shylock refuses and demands what the bond owes him. When they cannot dissuade him, he prepares to cut a pound of flesh from Antonio's chest, fully acknowledging this would kill him. Then Portia discovers a loophole, that the bond calls for a pound of Antonio's flesh, but if a drop of Christian blood is shed, Shylock's life and assets will be forfeit. Shylock then retreats and tries to take the earlier offer of 6,000 ducats, but Portia goes further still. The law also stipulates if an alien makes an attempt on the life of a Venetian citizen, his life is forfeit. You see, Shylock, as a Jewish man, is not considered a true citizen of Venice like Antonio. In the end, it's Antonio who gets to set the punishment for Shylock's crime. He chooses to have half of Shylock's wealth be presented to Lorenzo, Jessica's husband, 
and Shylock is forced to convert to Christianity, or, you know, probably die. Now, here's my struggle with the piece. The text shows the inhumane, anti-Semitic world that Shylock inhabits. But the ultimate punishment, being forced to convert to Christianity, is something that comes to Shylock by his own hand, by his refusal to show mercy. In the tradition of many tragic figures in theater, Shylock brings about his own demise. But as far as I can tell, in reality, Shylock would not have had a lot of say in the matter. One of the first ghettos was built in Venice in March of 1516. Prior to that, Jews could visit Venice, but they were not allowed to live in Venice. According to Shalbassi, a Venetian Jewish scholar, by ghettoizing them, Venice simultaneously included and excluded the Jews. In order to distinguish them from the Christians, they had to wear certain insignia, typically a yellow hat or a yellow badge, the exception being Jewish doctors who were in high demand and were allowed to wear black hats. The ghetto was comparatively less harmful than later ghettos would be. It offered some semblance of community and safety from a volatile Christian majority. But at night, the gates to the ghetto were locked, which also made it akin to a prison. The word ghetto actually originated in Venice, based on the word for a foundry, ghetto, since there was a copper foundry on that land before it was converted into the Jewish ghetto. In the Jewish ghetto, the Jews were not allowed to own land, they could only rent, and in Venice they were only allowed to work in a few professions. They could be doctors, dance or music teachers, peddlers, or moneylenders. And that was about it. At various times throughout medieval Europe, Jews were only allowed to work as moneylenders or peddlers. Shylock's world is probably more based on Elizabethan England's understanding of Jews than anything to do with Venetian society, since it's unlikely Shakespeare ever even visited Venice. Many say Merchant of Venice was written in response to his contemporary Christopher Marlowe's play, The Jew of Malta. And in England, Jews had been crucified and lynched in the 1250s. In the 1270s, all the Jews in England were rounded up for supposed coin clipping, and nearly 300 were hanged at the Tower of London. Then, in 1290, all of the Jews were expelled from the country by Edward I and were not officially allowed into the country until 1656. While England did not have an inquisition like Spain did, where Jews and Muslims were forced to either convert or be murdered, Jewish people were not technically allowed in England for over 300 years. Although anecdotal evidence suggests that some Jews did emigrate to England in that time, there was a home for converted Jews that was established by Henry III on Chancery Lane. Henry VIII consulted some Jewish people about Talmudic laws surrounding divorce when he was trying to divorce Catherine of Aragon. Some Jews came to England to escape the Inquisitions in other parts of Europe. Some pretended to be Christian or pretended they had been successfully converted from Judaism. While it's impossible to know much about their day-to-day -day difficulties, it seems their Judaism was only actively used against them if people believed they had committed a crime, such as in the case of Dr. Rodrigo Lopez, who was believed to have plotted to poison Queen Elizabeth. He was drawn and quartered for it. But Christians were very concerned with converting Jews in this time period. Often it was used in the push and pull between Catholics and Protestants as a way to confirm their doctrine was the true one. Converting Jews was seen as a way to legitimize their own faith. And even those who were converted were still considered separate and somewhat untrustworthy because if they could just become Christian, then there was no racial distinction between a Jew and a Christian. And England was very concerned with delineating the Jews as a race that was distinct from Christians. Not really based on any reality, it was all based in paranoia and rumors. Jews were believed to be dark-skinned like the Moors, have goggle eyes, and a distinct, unpleasant smell. The hooked nose motif became a popular image in later years, but Christians were obsessed with this idea of the monstrous Jew who could be seen coming from miles away. And this is perhaps one of the most enduring trends that went well into the modern day when it came to performances of Merchant of Venice. Actors would darken their skin to play the part, or exaggerate their features with makeup and wigs. The Arden Shakespeare edition of Merchant of Venice says there is an element of Edward Said's theory on Orientalism present in depictions of Shylock, and given how Robert Helpman played him in 1956 at the Old Vic, I can see what they mean. 
Also, there was the entirely invented concept of blood libel, which people in Elizabethan England were very obsessed with. The fiction was that rabbis would take the blood of Christian children for religious rituals, something that is to a degree echoed in Merchant of Venice with Shylock's Pound of Flesh. Not only that, but the act of usury, borrowing money with interest, was seen as vile and miserly. So much of Shylock's plot revolving around money is difficult. In one particularly challenging scene, after Jessica has eloped with Shylock's belongings, Shylock says, Two thousand nuggets in that, and other precious, precious jewels. <laughs> Would my daughter were dead at my foot? No, no. And the jewels in her ear? Adrian Schiller, who played Shylock at the Globe earlier this year, said, It's almost impossible for Shylock to talk about his daughter. The thing that really kills him in the end is that she sold his engagement ring. And my feeling is that this particular point in the play is an anti-Semitic litmus test. If you really think that what he's upset about is the money, you're an anti-Semite. But it's difficult to guess what Shakespeare thought of Shylock from the text alone, particularly in scenes like that. But I'm not interested in theorizing about that. I think the play turns on Shylock's speech in Act 3, Scene 1. A speech that you've probably heard a bit of before. If you prick us, do we not bleed? But in this scene, when friends of Antonio and Bassanio mock Shylock for the loss of his daughter and ask why he would want a pound of a man's flesh, Shylock gives one of the most humanizing speeches in the entire play and possibly the entire Shakespeare canon. I'm going to read it in full to you now. If it will feed nothing else, it will feed my revenge. He hath disgraced me and hindered me half a million laughed at my losses, mocked at my gains, scorned my nation, thwarted my bargains, cooled my friends, heeded mine enemies. And what's his reason? I am a Jew. Hath not a Jew eyes? Hath not a Jew hands? Organs, dimensions, senses, affections, passions, fed with the same food, hurt with the same weapons, subject to the same diseases, healed by the same means warmed and cooled by the same winter and summer as a Christian is. If you prick us, do we not bleed? If you tickle us, do we not laugh? If you poison us, do we not die? And if you wrong us, shall we not revenge? If we are like you in the rest, we will resemble you in that. If a Jew wrong a Christian, what is his humility? Revenge. If a Christian wrong a Jew, what should his sufferance be? By Christian example. Why revenge? The villainy you teach me, I will execute. And it shall go hard. But I will better the instruction. In this speech, Shylock demands these men see his humanity and then he holds the mirror up to them. In many ways, Shylock is a mirror of the society that raised him, a society that scorned and didn't want him. He says he'll mirror that hatred back at them. And in many ways, Merchant of Venice is a mirror for an audience. It projects what you want to see back at you. If you go to this play to see a monster, then Shylock will be your monster. There is a reason Nazis performed the play to celebrate Vienna being cleansed of Jews in 1943, where he was played with a pale pink face, bright greasy red hair, a yellow prayer shawl, and a splay-footed shuffling walk. But if you go to see Merchant of Venice looking to see a flawed man crushed under the weight of a world that hates him, then that is what Merchant of Venice will show you. Productions over the centuries have vacillated on whether Shylock is a cartoonish villain or a tragically misunderstood figure. As recently as 1998, there was a production at the New Globe Theatre that encouraged audience members to boo and hiss when Shylock appeared on stage, which, yikes. And yet, even in the 1800s, there were those who advocated for Shylock and stated that his was actually a tragic tale inside the supposed comedy. And while I'm here, I do think Shylock is a character that should only be played by Jewish actors. 
I've never seen a Shylock performed by a Gentile that didn't ring false in some way. Even the most well-meaning Gentile actors seem to stumble into horrendous interpretations of the character. And I wore a, a shabby, dirty, broken-down frock coat because I think that uh, the most important thing for Shylock in the play is money, possessions, and finance. And all of this brings me to possibly the most complicated character in the play, Jessica. We only get one scene between her and her father, which can be played as sympathetic or overbearing and abusive. But after this one scene, Jessica runs away and has almost no lines until Act 3, where we see her talking with the clown Lancelot, who continues to mock her for her heritage. I shall be saved by my husband. He hath made me a Christian. Truly, the more to blame he. We were Christians enough before. This making of Christians will raise the price of hogs. Even marrying a Christian has not fully absolved her of her heritage in the eyes of those around her. They continue to scorn and ignore her. But who comes here, Lorenzo and his infidel and my old Venetian friend? <laughs> She disappears again until Act 5, where she sits with Lorenzo, her new husband, and seems unhappy in her marriage. In such a night did young Lorenzo swear he loved her well, stealing her soul with many vows of faith and ne'er a true one. In such a night did pretty Jessica, like a little shrew, Slander her love. When Portia and Nerissa deliver the news of what will happen to Jessica's father, they give the document to Lorenzo, not Jessica. I don't believe Merchant of Venice is inherently anti-Semitic so much as I think it accurately depicts an anti-Semitic world. I wouldn't go so far as to call it good Jewish representation, especially when so many aspects play into and have perpetuated harmful stereotypes about Jews. But I do think Shakespeare stumbled onto some truths here, whether he intended to or not. After all, hath not a Jew eyes? If you prick us, do we not bleed? Shylock may not be a nice man, but as a character living in a society that continually dehumanizes him, spits on his Jewish gabardine and calls him dog, his rage is understandable, and something that I have found deeply relatable on my angrier days. And, you know, I think the casual Jew epithets in his other plays are far more anti-Semitic than the whole of Merchant of Venice. On the one hand, I get why productions cut these lines, but it's been so sanitized out of productions that I had to really dig to learn anything. Interestingly, 2021's The Tragedy of Macbeth by Jewish director Joel Cohen keeps the Jew line. Never of blaspheming Jew potentially as tacit acknowledgement of the anti-Semitism that has been sanitized out of so many Shakespeare plays. And I'm not sure I have a solid stance on this. I'm frustrated to be so caught off guard by my favorite play, but I don't want that line slapping me in the face while enjoying Much Ado either. And it's not like this is the only off-color element in Shakespeare plays, or in Much Ado About Nothing. Are you yet determined today to marry with my brother's daughter? I'll hold my mind where she and Ethiop. That line is Claudio saying he would keep his promise to marry Leonardo's niece no matter what she looks like, even if she were black. That's another line that's usually cut from modern productions of Much Ado About Nothing, and that's not getting into the whole dichotomy of fair and light being good while brown and dark is bad. She's too tall for a great praise. Too brown for a fair praise. And while Othello may have been about a moor, to use the terminology of the time, he was played by actors in brown or blackface until very, very recently. And that's not even touching on other appearances of and references to people of color in Shakespeare's work. Aaron in Titus Andronicus is a deeply troubling character from what I can tell. And then there's the casual language of slavery throughout nearly all his plays. We'll visit Caliban, my slave that never yields his kind answer. And just know that example is way more mild than some other lines Shakespeare wrote referencing slavery. If you want to dig into this more, I recommend the Globe Theater's YouTube series, Anti-Racist Shakespeare, where actors and scholars delve into the stuff one play at a time. 
They haven't covered all of his plays yet, but I'm sure they will in time. The thing about Shakespeare is, the dude lived in the 15 and 1600s, and his work will always be of its time. And the Eurocentric tendencies of Western literature classes means you're likely to read three or four Shakespeare plays, and if your school is better than mine, maybe you'll have one book assigned that was written by a person of color. Yes, Shakespeare is white. His view of the world was deeply based in the politics and understandings of Elizabethan England. In most of his texts, he casually echoed the sentiments of his time, whether it was casual racism or anti-Semitism, because he was about appealing to the masses. While I do love Shakespeare, and I love modern Shakespeare's determination to reimagine his texts in every way under the sun, literary education must expand beyond Shakespeare and his ilk. We should be reading Toni Morrison, James Baldwin, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, Nawal El Sadawi, Joy Harjo, and Scott Momaday, Leslie Marmon Silko, Ryunosuke Akutagawa, and so many more. When we discuss the classics that are so often revisited and reimagined, we usually mean books by white authors. Now, this isn't a call to cancel Shakespeare or stop teaching his beautiful words, but it's a call to expand on Shakespeare, to expand on the literary canon. We can keep revisiting and bringing new life to these so-called classics as long as we can also see beyond them to other works as well. So with that, let's talk about Act 3 of Much Ado. After Benedict's gulling, Act 3 begins with Hero and her maid Ursula doing a similar charade for Beatrice. But are you sure that Benedict loves Beatrice <gasps> so entirely? Now, the interesting thing about Beatrice's gulling is that Benedict's was more about extolling Beatrice's virtues and how much she loves him. She's an excellent, sweet lady, and out of all suspicion, she is virtuous. And she's exceeding wise. And down upon her knees she falls. Weeps, sobs, beats her heart, uh, tears her hair, prays, curses, oh sweet Benedict, God give me patience! <laughs> Beatrice's gulling is largely about her friends criticizing her flaws. Truly, Ursula, she is too disdainful. I know her spirits are as coy and wild as haggards of the rock. She cannot love, nor take no shape nor project of affection. She is so self-endeared. <laughs> <laughs> Due to that dichotomy, some will play Beatrice's gulling a little more seriously. And some try to up the comedy ante, coming up with even more ridiculous scenarios for Beatrice's attempts to eavesdrop on the conversation about her. If tall! A lance ill-headed if low, an agate very vilely cut. If speaking, why are they blown with all winds? But after they've successfully convinced her to give Benedict a chance, she has her only soliloquy in the play. What fire is in my ears? Can this be true? Stand I condemned for pride and scorn so much. My personal favorite take on the speech might be Eve Best in the 2011 Globe production. And then I look down and caught the eye of a girl who was standing about as far away as you were standing to me. I don't know who, you know, whose hand reached out first to whose, but anyway, we held each other's hand. <laughs> <laughs> For others say thou dost deserve, and I believe it! <laughs> Truly iconic. After this, we get a scene of Don Pedro and Claudio teasing Benedict. Conclude, he is in love. Nay! But I know who loves him. That what I know too. But after Benedict leaves to talk to Leonardo, Don John enters the scene and convinces Claudio and Don Pedro that Hero has been cheating on Claudio. He says he'll show them proof that very night. Then we get our first introduction to Dogberry, Virgis, and the Watch. And shout out to Michael Keaton for being the wildest Dogberry I've ever seen. You speak like an ancient the most quiet watchman, for I cannot see how sleeping should offend. It's funny because I find that dogberries can really overstay their welcome, so productions need to come up with some entertaining antics to make us forget that these guys are kind of stopping the plot for several minutes just to establish the watches on the lookout for shenanigans. I do enjoy Paul Hunter and Adrian Hood's takes on Dogberry and Virgis at the Globe, but for some reason Paul Hunter's Dogberry does this. Who think you the most 
war. Comparisons are war, odorous war, war, war. And if a merry meeting be wished, then God, what way, get down, uh, prohibited. A lot, and after a while, it's kind of annoying. Anyway, the watch is on the hunt for mischief, and two watchmen overhear Conrad and Baraccio discussing the plan Baraccio has already enacted to trick Claudio into thinking Hero has been disloyal. We should confirm any slander that Don John had made. Away oh, went Claudio enraged! Once he outlines the whole thing for Conrad, the Watchmen jump out and arrest the men, and in the 1972 CBS production, it plays out like this. which is so wild, I don't even know what to say about it. The next morning, Hero is getting ready for the wedding with Margaret, and Beatrice comes to talk with them, and she's a little under the weather. By my troth, I'm exceeding ill. Many productions choose to play this very literally, but considering this cold is gone after this scene, I like the productions that just either play it like she's hungover from the night's festivities, or she's just saying she's sick because she's moody about Benedict. Anyway, after this, Dogberry tries to waylay Leonardo before the ceremony to tell him of the plot against his daughter. I watch her have indeed war comprehended to uh, auspicious persons, and we would have them this morning examined before your worship. Unfortunately, Dogberry is, well, the way he is, and so Leonardo never really gets the message and runs off before Dogberry can make it clear that Hero may be in some danger at what is supposed to be her wedding. Now, publications of Shakespeare's plays have caused a lot of debates over the years. It seems Billy Shakes didn't actively pursue publication himself, but a few plays were published in quartos. Much Ado was published in quarto form in 1600. Then in 1623, seven years after his death, a folio of 38 of his plays, including Much Ado, was published under the title Mr. William Shakespeare's Comedies, Histories, and Tragedies. There are variations between printings of the plays, particularly differences between the folios and quartos. It's believed that the quartos were based on Shakespeare's own manuscripts, and the folio was likely based on manuscripts used by theaters that performed his plays. And going further down this rabbit hole can get really granular, but I believe most editions of Much Ado are following the quarto printing with minor changes. And in terms of the history of the bard himself, let me just state that most Shakespeare scholars agree Shakespeare wrote Shakespeare plays. According to the Folger Library edition of Much Ado About Nothing, unlikely as it seems to those who want the works to have been written by an aristocrat, a university graduate, or an important person, the plays and poems seem clearly to have been produced by a man from Stratford-upon-Avon with a very good grammar school education and a life of experience in London and in the world of life. London theater. The dude had a basic education in Latin and catechisms, he worked as an actor and a writer, and ended up writing plays for the royalty of his time. Anything beyond that is classist conspiracy bullshit. Sorry, kids. Although, for those who like to state that Shakespeare never had an original idea in his life, All the world's a stage. I might use that. Age does not wither nor custom stay of his infinite variety. Yeah, I like that. The inspiration he took from other stories and bits of legends was mostly incident. The prose, verses, and sonnets are seemingly his own. Although it should be noted that collaboration was fairly common in his day. A few of his plays are attributed to more than one author, such as All's Well That Ends Well and Pericles, Prince of Tyre. In Much Ado, the plot with Hero and Claudio has precedence in a few other stories, such as the fifth canto of Ludovico Ariosto's Orlando Furioso, where a maid is tricked into disguising herself as her mistress Ginevra while meeting a lover in order to besmirch the mistress's honor. Although, in this case, Ginevra's true beloved, Ariodante, defends her honor. The other commonly cited source that shares a lot of plot DNA with Much Ado is Matteo Bandello's 1554 novella La Prima Parte della Novelle. The story is set in Messina following a Sicilian rebellion against an occupying France. A Sir Timbrio falls in love with Phoenicia, the daughter of Messer Leonardo de Leonati. Sir Timbrio offers her marriage, and she accepts, but a jealous Sir Gerondo Alaria Valenziano also loves Phoenicia. He plots to destroy the match, and has a henchman go to Sir Timbrio and tell a tale of Phoenicia's disloyalty. A man climbs up the balcony to her room at night, and this convinces Sir Timbrio to call off the marriage. 
Phoenicia falls into a coma and seemingly dies, and her father holds a funeral for her. Sir Gerondo regrets his actions and tells Sir Timbrio of his plot, and the two men clear Phoenicia's name. Sir Timbrio and Phoenicia marry a year later, and only after Sir Timbrio recounts his love for the woman he thinks is dead. There's definitely a lot of plot similarity between the two stories in Much Ado, but there is no precedent for Beatrice and Benedict and they are by far the most popular element of the play. So much so that when French composer Hector Berlioz wrote an opera based on the play, he named it Beatrice et Benedict. Over the centuries, people revisit the pair over and over again for their sparkling wit and enemies-to-lovers romance, which some believe may have inspired Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice to some degree or another. Although in more conservative time periods, Beatrice was not thought of well. She was too outspoken and not at all ladylike. One 19th century critic called her an odious woman. <laughs> and in the more conservative 19th century, the play was even edited to sanitize elements that were found uncouth, such as the attitude of Beatrice. Those versions would soften her, making her more demure to the men in her life. But even an Elizabethan audience would have probably been shocked by her frankness. Beatrice was bucking stereotypes of her day, talking as openly as she did with such a verbal prowess. To quote the art in Shakespeare, this is significantly unlike the assumptions of much Renaissance misogynistic writing, where the link between verbal and sexual freedom is repeatedly underscored. Her verbal powers never call her chastity into question, and they are more than anything a source of delight. Go you into hell? No. But to the gate. And there will the devil meet me like an old cuckold with horns on his head and say, Get you to heaven, Beatrice, get you to heaven. Here is no place for you, maid! <laughs> so deliver I up my apes and away to St. Peter for the heavens he shows me where the bachelors sit, and there we live as merry as the days long. <laughs> Another notable aspect of productions throughout the years is the setting. Particularly from the 1900s onwards, there seems to have been a growing creativity in where and when the play is set in various stagings. Much has been made of the reference to a recent war ending. In the last 80 or so years, many productions will set the play after World War I or World War II or set it in proximity to some other recent upheaval. So with that, let's talk about Act Four. Act 4 takes us to Hero and Claudio's ill-fated wedding, and the tone of the whole play shifts over the course of this scene. What was broad and silly and light becomes dark and difficult. The ceremony begins and Claudio is stiff. You come hither, my lord, to marry this lady. No. To be married to her, friar, you come to marry her. <laughs> And soon he asks the friar to step aside and addresses Leonardo. Will you, with free and unconstrained soul, give me this maid, your daughter? Leonardo says, yes, of course, and, well... Yeah! Leonardo, take her back again! Give not this rotten orange to your friend! He proceeds to rail against Hero, demanding she confess to what she did not do. What man was he? Talked with you yesternight out at your window betwixt twelve and one. I spoke with no man at that hour, my lord. Why then you are no maiden. Eventually, Hero faints, and Claudio leaves with Don Pedro and Don John. Oh now, cousin, wherefore sink you down? Come, let us go. These things come thus to light, smother her spirits up. Beatrice holds her cousin and demands that somebody help her. Help, uncle! Hero! We're Hero Uncle! But Leonardo has been convinced by Claudio that his daughter is no longer a virtuous maiden, and so he proceeds to yell some more horrible shit at his daughter. Do not leave, Hero! Do not help thine eyes! Honestly, I'll get to Claudio, but I think there's some room to judge Leonardo in this scene as well. It's pretty rough. Would the two princes lie? And Claudio lie? Who loved her so that speaking of her foulness washed it with tears? It's from a little day! Finally, the friar intercedes because he also believes Hero's story and he thinks she should fake her death to fix things. With her dead, Claudio and the others will feel bad and recant their story. Everybody thinks this is a reasonable idea and shuffles off, leaving Benedict and Beatrice alone to talk. Have you wept all this while? Yeah. And I will weep a while longer. I will not desire that. You have no reason. I do it freely. This is one of my favorite scenes in the show. 
Benedict tries to offer assistance and Beatrice is too distracted or maybe too wrapped up in her own thoughts to take him seriously. How much might the man deserve of me that would write her? Is there any way to show such friendship? A very even way, but no such friend. And so Benedict decides to just go for it. I do love nothing in the world so well as you. <laughs> it's not that strange. As strange as the thing I know not. It were as possible for me to say I love nothing so well as you. But believe me not, and yet I lie not. It's so sweet and still a little funny as their back and forth continues. By my sword, Beatrice, thou lovest me. Do not swear and eat it. I protest. I love thee. <laughs> But then the scene turns again as Benedict asks what he can do for Beatrice, and she asks him to kill Claudio. I find it interesting how often audiences laugh at that line because the scene is whipping between tones so fast they don't know which way it's going next. Kill Claudio. <laughs> but Benedict says, Not for the wide world. And Beatrice gets one of the best speeches in the play as she rails against the perceived limitations of her sex. Oh, that I were a man! She wants to do this herself, but Elizabethan mores meant she was left without the ability to do so. And so she rages. Well, bear her in hand until they come to take hands. And then with public accusation, Uncovered slug, unmitigated rancor. Oh God, that I were a man, I would eat his heart in the marketplace. And congrats to Danielle Brooks for having the best read of my favorite line. Have you ever been so angry you wanted to eat a man's heart in the marketplace? Good God, I have. But Beatrice isn't done. I cannot be a man with wishing therefore. I will die a woman with grieving. And Benedict tells her, By this hand, I love thee. Use it for my love some other way than swearing by it. And it seems this is what convinces him. Think you in your soul the Count Claudio hath wronged Hero. Yeah, yeah, sure as I have a sword or a soul. And so he agrees. I am engaged. I will challenge him. I will kiss your hand and so leave you. Then we get a goofy Dogberry scene as Dogberry and Virgis attempt to report Conrad and Baraccio's wrongdoings. But Dogberry is kind of bad at it and Conrad calls him an ass, which upsets him greatly. Masters, remember that I am an ass! It's a funny scene, but again threatens to overstay its welcome. I am a wise fellow. And which is more, an officer! <laughs> And which is more, a householder. And which is more, a prettier piece of flesh than any in Messina. Some productions move Dogberry scenes around, I think in an attempt to create a better flow, but that's basically act four, so now we have to talk about the Claudio of it all. By the end of the play, he will be forgiven for his part in what happened, and I've never seen a production where I buy that, or moreover that I buy Hero forgiving him. The difficulty is that the tone of the play turns on this scene. It needs to be upsetting enough to justify Kill Claudio. And all the rest. The shaming of Hero must be an almost violent act to shift us from this <laughs> to this. God that I were a man! I would eat his heart in the marketplace! Some productions try to soften Claudio in the wedding scene, highlighting his youth or uncertainty, or just making him a little less mean in order to allow space for his forgiveness. But if the wedding scene plays out like anything less than an attack, then all of this... Is it not approved in the height of villain? And that slouch of scorn dishonored my kinswoman! ...feels overblown. Some productions try to build in moments for Claudio to regret his actions once he hears of Hero's death. Sometimes he gets a dark night of the soul, as it were. In the Globe 2022 production of Much Ado, Lucy Bailey told Globe magazine she struggled with the callow Claudio. We're exploring his night of penance as almost a metaphorical year where the seasons change. We take him on a journey, and he's shriven by the end of it. Sadly, I don't live in London, so I don't know how that plays, but it sounds really interesting. But critics have struggled for years with his character. 
One writer in the 1930s described him as a miserable specimen, while another about a decade later called him Shakespeare's least amiable lover. The art in Shakespeare suggests Claudio may have been a disappointing lover, even to Elizabethan audiences, but he is above all young, anxious for the approval of his elders and convention, unsure of himself, eager to do the right thing both in marrying and in extricating himself from a bad bargain. My main takeaway of the character is that he isn't too bright. Don John comes to him twice to try and trick him, and both times, Claudio knows it's Don John. Even if some productions put a mask on him, the text clearly acknowledges who he is. Senor! You are very near my brother in his love. And after the first try is proven to be a bald-faced lie, when this guy comes to him again with falsehoods about Hero, this dipshit goes, no wait, let's hear what he's gotta say. It's possible that the darkness and uncertainty surrounding Claudio is simply meant to be irreconcilable, that we aren't meant to forgive him or make sense of him, but rather accept the light and dark he brings to the comic solution of the play. I do like when Hero slaps him in the 2019 public theater version of Much Ado. <laughs> that felt good. So, Act 5 brings all things to their endings. It begins with Claudio and Don Pedro learning from Leonardo that Hero has supposedly died. Thou hast belied my innocent child! Thy slander has gone through and through her heart, and she lies buried with her ancestors." And he chastises them for it, but the pair hold firm in their view that what they did was right. Benedict shows up and challenges Claudio like he said he would. I will make it good how you dare, with what you dare, and when you dare. Do me right, or I will protest your cowardice. You have killed a sweet lady, and her death shall fall heavy on you. And then Dogberry and Virgis show up and tell Claudio and Leonardo all about Don John's wicked plan to frame Hero for acts she did not commit. Also, Baraccio having heard the story that Hero died from being so wronged or whatever is very contrite. The lady is dead upon mine and my master's false accusation. <laughs> I have drunk poison whilst he uttered it. And Dogberry wants everybody to know that Conrad called him an ass. Do not forget to specify when time and place shall serve that I am an ass. Hear, hear. This plaintiff, sir, the offender, sir, did call me ass. But Claudio and Don Pedro are, of course, deeply sorry that they maybe killed a woman, and Leonardo sets them their penance. First, they are going to tell all of Messina of Hero's good virtue, and then hold a funeral of sorts for her. Hang her an epitaph upon her tomb. Sing it to her bones. After all this, he tells Claudio he's got a niece who is the spitting image of his daughter. My brother hath a daughter. <laughs> Almost the copy of my child that's dead. <laughs> and Claudio will marry her. Your overkindness doth bring tears from me. I do embrace your offer. Claudio and Don Pedro leave to prepare Hero's funeral, and Leonardo thanks Dogberry for his efforts, addled though they were, and sends the watch on their way. God save the foundation. And now it's time to catch up with Benedict and Beatrice being cute. First, Benedict tries to write Beatrice a sonnet and fails. And knows me, how pitiful I desire. Oh, God. <laughs> And Beatrice shows up. Which thou come when I call? Yes, senor, and depart when you bid me. Ooh. Stay but till then. Then is spoken. Fare you well now. <laughs> and she asks for an update on the Claudio situation, which Benedict tells her is being sorted. Claudio undergoes my challenge. And then the two just kind of flirt for a few minutes. I pray thee now tell me, for which of my bad parts? Didst thou first fall in love with me? <laughs> it's cute, honestly. I have no notes. But for which of my good parts did you first suffer love for me? Suffer love. A good epithet. Thou and I are too wise to woo peaceably. What's funny is how earnest the pair are in private. Serve God. Love me. And men. But when asked to publicly acknowledge things in a few minutes, the pair will absolutely short circuit. Then there's Hero's funeral, which some productions have Hero present at, either pretending to be the corpse or hiding somewhere in the room. 
It's another attempt to make sense of her forgiving Claudio. This way she can hear how sorry he is. And I don't hate the concept. Hero doesn't get a lot of agency in the text itself, so I love any touch that gives more to her character. Sometimes Claudio has his Dark Knight of the Soul here, and then it's time for the second wedding. Before it starts, Benedict asks the friar and Leonardo's permission to marry Beatrice. Or undo me, one of them. <laughs> Leonardo says yes, makes some references to the gulling that Benedict does not get. Your answer, sir, is enigmatical. <laughs> and then it's time for the ceremony. Which is the lady I must seize upon? Four women walk out, hidden by veils, and Claudio has to swear to the friar he'll be married before Hero reveals herself. <laughs> Another hero! Nothing certainer. One hero died defiled, but I do live. All this amazement can I qualify? When after that the holy rites are ended, I'll tell you largely of fair hero's death. And then it's time for Benedict to make his move. Which is Beatrice? <laughs> I answer to that name. Suddenly, in front of a room full of people, both instantly start posturing and denying any sort of affection for the other. Do not you love me? Why, uh, no. <laughs> no more than reason. Why then, your uncle, the prince, and Claudio have been deceived. They, they, they swore you did. Do not you love me? Truth, no, no more than reason. Why then, my cousin, Margaret, and Ursula are much deceived, for they did swear you did. They swore you're almost sick for me. They swore that you were well nigh dead for me. Luckily, their friends and family know how silly the pair are. They each have a love letter written from one of them to the other. I particularly like David Tennant and Catherine Tate's reactions to the letters. But it's their hands against their hearts, as Benedict says. Come, I will have thee. But by this light, I take thee for pity. I would not deny you. But by this good day, I yield upon great persuasion. And partly to save your life, for I was told you were in a consumption. Peace, I will stop your mouth. As Benedict said, the pair can never woo peaceably, but it's so fun to watch them lovingly go at it. When asked how he feels about being married, Benedict says, I'll tell thee what, Prince. <laughs> A college of witcrackers cannot flout me out of my humor. Claudio, in that thou art like to be my kinsman, live unbruised and love my cousin. A messenger tells us that Don John has been captured and Benedict says he'll be dealt with soon enough, but now it's time to strike up the pipers. It's time for a dance and a happy ending and all things that sort so well. I do think one of the big things we can take away from Much Ado is the consequences that come from not listening to women. Although, to be clear, while the play focuses on cis women specifically, nowadays a lot of trouble is coming out of not listening to people who are marginalized for their genders and their bodies. In the real world, we're not just talking about women, but in the play we are. In Much Ado, all the drama comes because the women are not listened to. When Hero denies the accusations against her, Claudio and Don Pedro are convinced. What kind of catechizing call you this? To make you answer truly to your name! Is it not Hero? Leonardo threatens death on his own daughter rather than listen to her. And nobody listens to Beatrice either. On my soul, my cousin is belied! Eventually, the friar comes to their aid, and good job, friar. The interesting one in this scene to me is Benedict. While I do like to read his concern here as natural and genuine, I do think his earnest reaction is at least a byproduct of opening up to his own feelings about Beatrice. Because if you want to talk about growth, Benedict at the start, Because I will not do them the wrong to mistrust any, so I do myself the right to trust none, has come a long way to being this guy. Now tell me. How doth your cousin? But I think my favorite takeaway from the play is simply the joys that come from being honest with yourself and the people in your life. People spend a lot of this play lying to each other and to themselves. Do you any embassage to the pygmies rather than hold three words conference with this harpy? And when all the layers get stripped away and people start saying what they mean and what they feel, it's a wonder to behold. In the Ketuvim, there is a poem known as Shir Hashirim, or the Song of Songs, which says, Eat, lovers, and drink. Drink deep of love. 
I was asleep, but my heart was wakeful. Hark, my beloved knocks. Let me in, my own, my darling, my faultless dove. For my head is drenched with dew, my locks with the damp of night. Because life is short and regret is long, so be honest with yourself and your loved ones. Love with purpose and be joyful. A man is a giddy thing. And this is my conclusion. So things have been a little tight financially, and so it comes to that time where I got to pay rent by doing a sponsorship. And so today's video is brought to you by Curiosity Stream and Nebula. For anybody who was following the drama with my last video getting blocked everywhere except the U.S., Nebula subscribers were able to watch it right away with no issues because the Streamy Award-nominated Nebula was built and run by creators, and it's a platform where we don't have to worry about being demonetized or the dreaded algorithm. On Nebula, you can see exclusive content from amazing creators like Princess Weeks, Jacob Geller, Jesse Gender, FD Signifier, and so many more. And if you like this video, it's available on Nebula without this pesky ad. What does this have to do with CuriosityStream? Well, they're an educational platform full of documentaries and nonfiction content, so... Here! Educate yourself! And if you sign up with the link below, not only do you get access to Curiosity Stream, but you'll also get Nebula for free. It's not a trial, you'll have it as long as you're a Curiosity Stream member, and for a limited time, Curiosity Stream is offering 26% off their annual plan. That's less than $15 a year for both Curiosity Stream and Nebula. And while you're on Curiosity Stream, check out their Curious Mind series on Shakespeare. It's a series of short episodes where they interviewed the director of the Folger Shakespeare Library, so that's neat. You can sign up now by going to curiositystream.com slash ladynightthebrave. So click on the link in the description or go to the URL to get 26% off Curiosity Stream and Nebula for a year. So thank you all for watching me nerd out about my favorite Shakespeare play. Sorry this one took me so long to finish, but the last video was a lot, and so was dealing with the copyright, which, just to reiterate, it is public everywhere now, and I put a lot of work into that, and, you know. Anyways, I don't think there's any other major housekeeping notes. Hopefully the next video doesn't take me so long. Thank you for everybody who stuck around, and thank you to my patrons for your support. That's all for now, and I'll see you on the next one.